Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of Embedded Linux Conference. Uh, my name is Tim Bird. I'm a principal software engineer at Sony Electronics, and I'm here with Harish Bansal, who's a technical engineer at TimeSys. And uh, we're going to be talking today about even more board farm goodness. Uh, so this is an update of a talk that we've given in the past about a REST API uh, that we use for automated testing. Um, and we'll be explaining some of the concepts of about that uh, today. So uh, welcome, welcome to our session. So this is uh, just the abstract of the talk. Uh, I'm not going to read through all this, but this is just something I like to tack on to the slides so that people uh, coming in later can use as a reference a, a quick description of, of what we're going to be talking about. Uh, so this is the outline for the talk today. So um, in case you haven't seen our previous talks on this topic, uh, we're going to do a quick review of the REST API concepts. And in particular, we're going to talk about the um, farm resource model, which is uh, an important part of kind of the APIs that we've developed for, for automated testing of, of boards in a board farm. Um, but the meat of the presentation is really uh, going to be about the updates since last year. That's the important part. So what have we accomplished in the last year? We'll be talking about some audio testing APIs uh, and giving uh, some demos of those. And then also we'll be talking about web application testing and in particular uh, the integration uh, into Jenkins uh, as a CI pipeline of uh, the APIs. And so how to run, uh, how to use these APIs from inside a Jenkins CI pipeline. Uh, and uh, then we'll wrap up with a discussion of future directions. So um, uh, we'll start with a problem statement. Uh, and this is the same problem statement we used to introduce uh, the API concept a, a couple of years ago, actually now. Um, but basically, there's many tests uh, that are available for uh, embedded Linux platforms. Uh, but there's no standardized way of running tests on physical devices, right? So there's a lot of different test frameworks, things like uh, Fuego or Jenkins or Kernel CI. Um, uh, but, and, and there are some board farm frameworks, things like LabGrid. Uh, but there's no standardized way to use uh, different tests uh, in, you know, uh, among different board farms. Uh, and the reason for this is that every board farm, uh, every farm implements their test infrastructure differently. So you, uh, each farm uses kind of its own set of hardware. And uh, because there are no standards in this area, uh, people cobble together their own scripts uh, to do the, to control the hardware in their lab. Um, uh, things like the power control and the networking and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the deployment to the devices. And the end result of this is that tests that are written for one lab, uh, because there's this interface to the, the control scripts, uh, those tests you won't work with other labs because those other labs have different scripts. And the end result is nobody can share tests, which is a bad thing. So we're in an open source ecosystem. Uh, we'd like to be able to you know, build upon each other's work and collaborate. So our solution is to create a standard method to access uh, uh, hardware in a board farm to access the boards in a board farm. And uh, this gives us a couple of nice benefits. One is that board farm technologies can evolve separately uh, from the interface to the farm. All right, because we've got now got an abstraction layer there. Uh, but the most important thing is that tests can be written that work in more than one lab, right? And test frameworks can work with more than one lab if they're integrated with that API. So those are all really nice benefits uh, that we'd like to see. If you look at, uh, in general, at the problem space, uh, you'll see that uh, if you're doing more than just software testing, if you're doing hardware and software integration testing, uh, you need you all, all, always have some kind of uh, hardware that's off the device under test. Uh, that um, So just take a very, very simple test, like a GPIO test, right? So on the device under test, uh, you're going to toggle the GPIOs, and those are going to turn on and off uh, signals. Uh, but you need a device that's measuring that uh, in terms of hardware. Uh, and so you need to actually be communicating with some other piece of hardware in your lab. And so you need two endpoints to control, one on the device under test and one with another piece of hardware. And that's true for all of the, uh, the rest of the things on this, um, on this slide. So audio and video playback tests, if you're actually testing the hardware, not just the software, like in loopback mode, uh, you need to have a capture device that maybe is off of the board. Uh, well, not as maybe, is really off the board. Same thing with power measurement. If you're using an external power monitor, 
uh, you need to, you know, apply your workload to the device under test, but then capture the power measurement data from the external monitor. So you need need to talk to a separate device. The same thing with USB robustness. Um, so <clears throat> in in all of those examples, you need a second. Uh, you need to be communicating with hardware in the lab uh, that is not the same as the device under test. And if you're going to do that in a lab independent way, uh, then you need to have an abstraction API to do that, which is uh, exactly what we're proposing uh, with our API. So the API actually uh, has two high level concepts that uh, I think are really important. One is the API between the framework and the lab. So you have multiple test frameworks. And if you want uh, a single test framework to be able to talk to boards in different labs, then you need some kind of abstraction and uh, to do that. So that's that's the first uh, abstraction that we have as part of the API is how to communicate to boards in the lab, no, no matter which lab they're in. And then the second uh, abstraction is uh, on the next slide is uh, <clears throat> how to talk within a, an individual lab. How do you talk communicate with the resources, the other pieces of hardware that are in the lab uh, that you're going to uh, be controlling. So if you're doing power control of the board, you're talking to a device that's that's not the device under test. And, and same thing with power measurement, audio, video capture, networking, GPIO, storage, all of that. So we have these APIs that we can communicate, use to communicate with those pieces of hardware. And we've tried to abstract the operations so that uh, it doesn't matter which power control uh, unit you're using in your lab, uh, you the test can use the same APIs. And that's what's going to allow us to, to reuse tests between labs. Um, so uh, the REST API itself, <clears throat> excuse me, actually consists of kind of two parts. So it is a web-based API. It's based on HTTPS and JSON. Uh, consists of that, uh, I guess, web protocol, and then there's a command line interface that goes along with it. So the REST API itself is, is based on an extension to the Lava REST API. So Lava is a um, fairly industry standard uh, tool or platform, uh, stands for Lenaro uh, Automation Validation Architecture or something like that. Um, but it can be implemented because it's just HTTP calls and JSON can be implemented completely uh, uh, fully with just curl and jq. So jq stands for JSON query. And uh, so you can actually uh, perform, if you, if you wanted to type quite a bit, you could perform everything you needed to manually on the command line just with those, with those two uh, Linux command lines. Uh, but we have provided a command line tool, actually a couple of different implementations of command line tool, do the, the same operations as the REST API, but the command line tool makes it uh, much more suitable for human use and, and also for automated use. So it uh, makes it so that it is scriptable. So, uh, and that's, uh, we have multiple implementations of those. Uh, we have one from TimeSys uh, that is a shell-based client and, and the server is based on the Lava servers server that's based on Django and that's a uh, in production now and uh, you can get the client for that at that git repo now there's a separate implementation called lab control which is a plain cgi script uh, server or plain cgi script on the server side and then the client is a python client so uh, the clients are available in multiple uh, implementations uh, that is also source available now but i'll warn you uh, that it's alpha level quality so uh, don't don't get your hopes up too high. But uh, if you want to play around with it, that's available. So we added a bunch of stuff in 2021, a um, uh, lot more implementations. I'm not going to go through this slide because you can go back and look at the uh, this um, presentation that we had at Embedded Linux Conference last year. Uh, but the main purpose of this talk is to talk about what happened uh, this year. So what, what has happened since the, our, our last talk? And so the new thing uh, we're going to be talking about is uh, the audio testing API. So we have APIs for audio capture. And, uh, and then the other big thing is integration with the Jenkins pipeline. So there's also a minor feature. Well, TimeSys already had a feature about web terminal, uh, but um, that was added to lab control. So there's a little bit more feature parity there, but uh, we're not gonna actually talk about that today. 
So um, I want to talk a little bit, uh, just kind of introducing the audio API. So the, uh, we did a couple of things uh, when we added the new audio API. First is we had to add the audio resource type. So we already had uh, a command uh, called git resource. And uh, you can see that there's now um, an audio resource that's available in the lab. And, uh, and that's the second bullet there is an example of uh, the actual command you'd use to, in, in a shell script to get that, the audio resource for, say, HDMI 2. But the other thing that we found uh, is that it, uh, we added a, a new optional argument called the feature. Um, and that is important uh, to indicate the particular importer output item on the board uh, for which the test is being run. So uh, we are testing in our labs, we're testing a Raspberry uh, Pi uh, Model 3, I think, and um, it has multiple outputs, right? So we're doing a playback test is the kind of the nature of the test we're running. Uh, but we have to indicate, um, we, we could be capturing that audio from uh, the Raspberry Pi has an HDMI channel, it has a headphone jack, and it um, uh, there are some products that, that have multiple of those uh, or even output via speakers. And so you need some way as part of the API to distinguish which audio element uh, that you're actually capturing that you're testing. And so we had to add this feature argument uh, to the Git resource call in order to uh, uh, you know, discover the appropriate resource in the lab for that particular uh, audio element. Um, and so the other thing, so basically we already talked about this, we previously supported resource types were the power management camera and serial, we've added the new resource type, the audio, and uh, what we did was we reused the same API, the, we had some, uh, a capture API uh, that we introduced, and it consists of uh, several different verbs, and for other, other systems like power measurement, uh, we, we used four verbs. We have start capture, stop capture, get data, and delete. And those, those verbs were used for like power measurement data. If we're talking to, um, a, you know, a, a device that measures power to, to, to retrieve the data, but that was ASCII data. What we found in, in, uh, doing the audio testing is that once we started working with raw audio data, uh, it didn't really fit very well into the JSON model. So, uh, our request response, we send a JSON request, get back a, a JSON response normally. Uh, but we had to switch over uh, from doing uh, get data to retrieve a JSON response from the server to get ref, uh, where we get an URL path uh, to the captured data on the server. So uh, it becomes a, a two-part operation to retrieve that audio data uh, as part of the, the capture. Uh, but other than that, it's, uh, the API is basically the same. Uh, so we're, we feel like uh, the resource model and in particular the capture API system that we have uh, is lending itself to these uh, different, these new resource types pretty well. Um, so let's see, next slide. Okay, so that's just the brief introduction. Uh, and now I wanna get into our actual use case. So uh, it's a lab independent uh, quality test of playback. And you can see these are the REST API mappings. Um, the, the test itself proceeds in a couple of different phases. Uh, there's resource detection, audio capture, audio playback and cleanup. And you can see the command lines in the, in the middle column there. Uh, these are the actual command lines uh, that are used uh, for those different operations, things like getting the resource ID, um, and then starting, stopping, and getting a reference to the audio file uh, that's created as part of the capture. Um, and then during the playback itself, we use uh, upload to upload the, the test file and SSH run uh, to execute a playback command on the, on the device. Um, and then we, during cleanup, we're, we're uh, using a, the delete, um, uh, audio delete is for the, the captured playback data on the, in the lab. And then we also have some local commands uh, that we use to clean up data. But this also shows you the, the, the column on the right, uh, shows you what the actual URLs are for the REST API for, for those operations. 
So uh, the high level concept here is uh, from both Fuego and from TimeSys, uh, we can run tests on the Sony embedded board farm. So I have a farm sitting right next to me here uh, with a Raspberry Pi board and some audio cables hooked up. And the same thing is true of the TimeSys's lab. And uh, uh, for this particular demo, I'm gonna be running the tests from Fuego. Um, and then we've got also Harish will show uh, showing TimeSys as a remote um, uh, running the test on, on their lab as well. So uh, let's see. So here's the hardware configuration. So we've got in our lab, in each of our labs, uh, we've got a device under test, which is a Raspberry Pi, and it is hooked up via the network to the lab server. Um, and uh, it also in each of our labs, we have a lab resource. There's some kind of microphone uh, capability in each lab, um, or rather just an audio input device, a recording device. And uh, so we've got the audio input hooked up to the audio output and the lab knows about that connection, right? So we can query the lab for uh, what lab device is going to be recording the audio. Um, and we discover that at runtime for the test. So that's part of that abstraction for the resource model. The actual test sequence itself will consist of, um, we're going to discover the lab resource by communicating with the lab. Uh, we're going to actually put an audio test file on the device under test and then initiate capture. And notice these are going, the arrows are going to different devices kind of back and forth as we, as we stage stuff for the test. Then we're going to, we initiate the capture on the audio device, initiate the playback, uh, then end the capture. And uh, then the, the real work of the test, I guess, is uh, comparing the played versus captured data. And we'll, we'll explain the, the tools we used for that. And, and then the last couple steps are removing the data. And we have to remove it a couple of places. We remove it locally, uh, on, the, on the lab resource, uh, on the device under test, and then on the test host. Uh, so we're going to clean up all, all of the temp files and stuff. So if we look at what the API looks like in practice, so we have an audio playback test as a shell script, and uh, we're using um, a client, a, a variable to indicate the client, because sometimes we're using uh, EBF or sometimes we're using LC. But uh, the first thing we do is get the resource by doing a, a get resource uh, audio and then the device ID, which is the feature. Um, and then we upload the audio file. Uh, this is just to give you a flavor of what it looks like. It's a little bit ugly because this is shell scripting. And so you see a lot of, you know, dollar sign variables in here. Uh, but you can see that we get a, a uh, we get the resource from the first part and we use that resource later when we're doing the audio capture. So we do token equals client resource audio start. Uh, we, we run a playback command on the actual device under test using that, uh, audio file that we uploaded, uh, and then we stop the capture, we, we get the reference to the token, we download that the captured audio, um, and then we do uh, data analysis. In this case, we're using Alsabat and Sox. I'll talk more about those and how we used them later. And, uh, and then we use some more APIs for cleanup of stuff in the lab and, and locally. So here's a video. Um, and we'll go ahead and, and start that. This is showing the Jenkins interface inside Fuego. We have a couple of different boards uh, in different labs. Uh, this is gonna be running against a board in the Tim's Fuego lab. Um, and we do the build, which shows that we're starting uh, instance 35 of this test. And we in Fuego, we do a couple of um, uh, startup operations uh, to prepare the board. Notice that uh, we have some output that's showing that I've uh, detected which resource is capturing the audio from the device, in this case, a rear desk microphone jack or, or rear microphone jack on, on a desktop machine. Um, and the test proceeds very quickly um, and it shows that I passed all the tests. Um, I, I ran that was a live test. Well, recorded. Uh, but I also did the same test, exact same tests I had run on uh, stuff in TimeSys's lab. And so just uh, to show you the, the type of uh, output we're getting from Alsabat, Alsabat is a tonal analysis tool, uh, which shows we passed there. And then we also did a SOX analysis of the data as well, and showed that our frequency was about the same. Well, it was exactly the same, actually. This is 
Timesys has a really good audio connection between the board and their microphone and their lab. Um, so that's that's uh, my test, and I'll let Harish uh, talk about uh, his um, uh, his test that he that he ran in his lab or from his host. Thanks, Tim. Uh, so my name is Harish Bansal, and I work for uh, uh, Timesys and uh, Timesys Embedded Code Form Group. So the test which uh, uh, Tim just showed, I ran the same audio test uh, on my uh, computer, local computer, with no physical uh, uh, connection to uh, Timesys board form. So I ran the same script. Uh, let me show you a quick recorded video of this. So it's no. the same test script uh, which uh, Tim used in Fego. Uh, you would see the similar uh, uh, logging statement as uh, Tim showed, uh, similar analysis. So it, it passed the peak uh, detected at target frequency. These are the SOC, SOC analysis data and uh, the frequency is exactly matched. So now I request uh, Tim to resume. So what did we do in terms of the actual analysis of the data? What was the, what was the physical test? Um, so we used two different uh, uh, audio analysis programs. We used Alsabat and SOS uh, and SOX, and I'll, I'll talk about that. So Alsabat is the name of a program that's part of Also Utilities, um, Also Utilities Project. Uh, and this is a test that can be used to do analysis of, um, of frequency data uh, in a test, it's normally run in a loopback mode. So we're taking a test that has been developed to test an ALSA driver uh, and the ALSA configuration on machine. And we've modified it just slightly so that instead of just testing in loopback mode, uh, it actually uh, can be used to test data that is captured on a, on a different device. So um, we, in order to do that, we needed to add a new mode of operation, and that was to analyze data from a pre-captured file. So we made a very minor modification. Actually, we still need to send the patch for that upstream. Uh, we think that would be useful for other people using this tool. Um, one of the things about this, uh, actually back up, uh, is that we did want to run Alsabat Al on the device under test. We're not, we're not running it there. Uh, because that's not where the captured data is. We are capturing the data actually on a separate device. Um, and notice that this does not require that we, uh, we need to be able to run also bat on the host where the test is executing. And we don't really want to run it on the target or the device under test. And the only capability that we need on the device under test is the ability to to play the sound over you know, the audio output device. And so we used a play from that, which is also from Aussie Utils. But the interesting thing is that could be anything that's available on the device under test. So if you're testing like a product that has a particular playback command, you would use that playback command as, as part of the test. Um, and But the Alsabat itself, which is the analysis tool, does not ever run on the device under test. OK, and then the same thing is true for SOX. So SOX is a tool that allows you to uh, perform a number of operations on an audio stream. Uh, uh, and uh, one of the things that you can do is uh, you, it, you, you uh, can sequence a bunch of filters. One of the filters is called a stat filter uh, that just gives you data about that stream. And uh, so uh, we're just, uh, in, the, in our case, we're looking at a couple of pieces of data. We decided to look at the frequency to see if there was any frequency drift. Um, and uh, in, in TimeSys's lab, we didn't detect any frequency drift. Uh, in, in my lab, I don't know if I have a, a crummy connection, uh, but I did have some frequency drift that, uh, and so I had to add a threshold uh, to, to uh, decide if I wanted to ignore this. So the audio sounded fine to me, but in terms of tonal, uh, analysis, it came back with a, a difference in the frequency. And so it turns out that there's a couple of weird harmonics. Maybe I've got an ungrounded cable, audio cable or something. I'll turn the time over to Harish to talk about the other major thing we did this year, which was the, the web app and the CI integration that we've been working on. 
Thanks, Tim. Uh, so this year, on top of uh, board form uh, infrastructure independent test, uh, one extension uh, we are working on is how to use REST APIs to set up infrastructure independent continuous deployment and continuous test pipelines, pipelines which can perform auto device provisioning and test execution. Let's see one such example for testing web UI of an application which is running uh, on a board connected to board form and where uh, Jenkins is used as the CI2. Uh, this is the test uh, environment setup. Our Raspberry Pi 3 board is connected to Zombie. Uh, Zombie is time series a lab controller hardware where uh, devices or devices under test are physically connected. Uh, there could be multiple zombies and all zombies are controlled uh, by EBF server software which runs on a centralized remote machine. Uh, on the left there is a Jenkins setup which has board form command line tool, EBF CLI tool installed to perform operations on the remote board. Application under test is an Agile book application written in Python. It runs on port 1990 of the device, the Spirit Pi 3 port. Uh, in times of port form, devices or DUTs are connected to Zombie's private network. And any app, application which is running on device port is not uh, accessible outside of Zombie network. So here uh, we forwarded port 1990 web app port of the device to zombies 1990 port so that uh, from the Jenkins node this application could be accessed using zombies IP address and the forwarded 1990 port. This is the test pipeline here each uh, block represent a pipeline step. Uh, it runs from left to right. The first step uh, takes the application under test and publishes it on the Jenkins interface. Uh, next, uh, device reservation steps, it reserves uh, a device connected to board form to this uh, pipeline. App deployer uh, does the provisioning work, it reboots the board, uh, verifies whether the device has booted uh, up, and then it downloads the build to be tested, application build to be tested from the app publisher uh, step and uh, transfer it to the device. Test runner then uh, starts the web application on the device, uh, runs the uh, test scripts and collects the test results. And finally, device release stops the web application on the device. Uh, it uh, releases the, uh, the device so that other users or pipeline can use it. Uh, and then finally powers up the device. Now let's see a video of this pipeline in execution. Uh, it's a recorded video. So here we are on the Jenkins uh, pipeline page. Uh, all the blocks you see are pipeline step. And when this uh, Selenium test runner pipeline step would run, you will see a window on the right, which would show in browser uh, test actions. So here we go. Uh, we could see the in browser test actions. Uh, it would run three test cases, adding a user, editing a user detail, and finally deleting the user. And on the left uh, Jenkins page, uh, uh, these uh, the color of these uh, blocks, uh, they represent their execution state. Blue means the, that pipeline step is still to be executed. If it's uh, yellow, that means uh, it's under execution. Greens means successfully executed. And in case uh, a pipeline step fails, it would turn red and none of the uh, uh, remaining pipeline steps on the right would run. Now let's go and see the test results right from Jenkins. So this was our test suite, the test address book. And all the tests ran all three tests passed. Test API is mapping with the pipeline step. Uh, in the first column, we have uh, pipeline steps. Middle column has corresponding uh, EPF command line tool commands that were used in, in, in that step. And uh, in the last column, we have corresponding uh, REST APIs. 
device is a vision step uh, it uh, uses a device info command to log device properties in the uh, jenkins uh, job execution logs it uses allocate to reserve uh, port form device uh, to this pipeline in case of app uh, deployer power reboot is used to power cycle the port ssh run is uh, uh, used here to clean up any uh, test run artifacts which are lying from the previous unfinished test job and SSH upload is used for transferring the application under test build to the uh, device. Test runner uh, makes use of SSH run command to start a web application under test on the device. And uh, in device release step, uh, it's used to stop the applica application and uh, delete the application source uh, from uh, the device. Uh, power off to shut down the device and release to deallocate the device so that some other user or pipeline could pick it up. Uh, the step uh, prefix with uh, shed, uh, orange asterisk here are only for time cells port form since it requires a, a port forward additional port forwarding step. It, it might not be required for other, other setups. So, so far, uh, we confirmed that Jenkins pipeline could be used for device provisioning and test execution. Uh, we, these pipeline could be extended by having another step at the start, which uh, does the uh, actual application build. And then this whole extended pipeline, uh, which does the application build, deploys that application on another board connected to the board form and uh, does the test execution it can be auto triggered as per the predefined jenkins scheduling policy which could be nightly weekly or on every every code check in to application source uh, currently this pipeline uh, works in Times is a uh, lab uh, with Times is board form software since it has this additional board forwarding step which might not be applicable to other labs. Uh, we are working on running uh, this similar pipeline in Sony's lab uh, with Fego. Uh, now I would request uh, uh, Tim to talk about the future uh, roadmap items. Okay, so we've shown you a couple of new features, uh, but we're not done yet. So, of course, uh, we think this board farm stuff is a, a good idea and we want to continue to promote the use of this API and, and the implementations that we've developed. Uh, we have some more API ideas for things we're going to do in the future, uh, particularly the, the one that's kind of on our short list is keyboard and mouse API. Uh, so there are a number of different ways of um, uh, kind of generating keyboard events on a device under test and mouse events. Uh, things like VNC, or uh, you can use a little board called a Teensy board for simulating USB keyboards. And we'd like to write an abstraction over those so that we can do kind of uh, uh, tests that require keyboard and mouse inter interaction. Uh, and if we've talked in the past about doing CAN bus and USB bus and other buses. Um, and then another area that we really are interested in is the provisioning APIs, which is installation and board bring up. And, and so uh, we're starting to have conversations with other groups about that. Um, one thing that uh, TimeSys has a client that wants to do this uh, testing all from Windows. And so uh, we'll probably be looking at writing a Windows client uh, for the CLI tools. Should be pretty easy because of the simplicity. I mean, if you can write it in a shell script in Linux, you can should be able to write it as a Windows client. Um, and uh, then we also want to integrate with more existing test suites, for instance, LTP and KSELF test. We want to add some hardware testing capabilities to those tests now. They're all software tests now, as far as we can tell. Um, and then after that, uh, next slide, we want to be integrate with additional test frameworks, right? So we've got, we've shown uh, with Fuego, Jenkins, uh, Kernel CI, uh, we showed in the past a robot test work test framework we showed in the past uh, but we know that there are more test frameworks out there uh, in particular we want to see how to integrate with uh, additional board farm infrastructure uh, so 
uh, things like LabGrid and GitLab uh, that we haven't integrated with yet. Uh, we want to. Uh, we also want to create test pipelines for other types of testing. So we've uh, a lot of we've done a lot of hardware testing, but we want to uh, apply these same principles to things like system testing desktop applications, desktop user interface testing. And now that we've got, uh, we've got some familiarity with Selenium and, and uh, as we start working on a mouse and a, and a keyboard API, we can start doing that. And then finally in the area, this is kind of related to the provisioning. We wanna look at uh, different boot and deployment mechanisms uh, in these pipelines. So whether a uh, board boots, boots with U-boot or fast boot, or uses NFS, a TFTP, or an SD card, or boots up via USB. We want to be able to support all those different ways of getting uh, the software under test onto the onto the board, and also the test materials onto the board. Um, and then the final thing, of course, is you got to use this stuff in production testing in order to shake out the bugs and and especially to refine the APIs. So that's that's what's next on our agenda. And we'd love to talk to all of you uh, about all of this. So at this point, uh, this is a recorded talk, but uh, uh, me and um, Harish and I should both be available for comments uh, for the remainder of this session. So I'd like to thank you for your time and now we'll take some questions or comments. Yeah, I'm told to switch the HDMI. Uh, here's the chat window. We don't have anything, questions from chat. Any any questions on our on our board farm stuff uh, from any, any in-person attendees? Yeah. Okay, the, the question was, uh, does this uh, test framework support uh, um, support a setup that involves a, a low capability device? And yes, very specifically it does. So uh, we, one of the reasons that we, um, is structured the way it is, is that the, we want to run as little as possible on the actual device under test. So if you have, uh, like, well, I have, I have, I have done this with an, a NutX board, not these exact same tests, but uh, I have a board in my lab that runs NutX, which is a non-Linux operating system. And uh, the idea is that uh, I don't have to run a bunch of Linux commands to be testing stuff on that board. Uh, it does have to have the capability to, like, uh, I, I, I'm thinking on the fly here because I didn't do the audio test on that board, but it is a board that has audio output. So I would have to modify the command to actually start the audio. Uh, but other than that, the, a lot of the work is happening on other devices in the lab. So the lab, you know, my, my, uh, in my lab, I have several audio capture devices. I'd have to have one hardwired to the output from, from that small board. But the, the idea, so, uh, that was the long way of saying yes. <laughs> so it's uh, it is intended to to support uh, testing devices of different capabilities and even non Linux devices. So yeah, follow up. Oh. Okay, let me, I'm not sure. Uh, so you're talking about, okay, so the question is if, uh, um, if it can also uh, communicate with a, a device that's a gateway to a, to a uh, low capability device. And I believe so, I, I'd have to look and see, what you have to have in your lab is you have to have, th there's gotta be something in the lab uh, that, um, translates the abstractions that we're doing down to the lab, the hardware you have in the lab. So underneath, so, and TimeSys has different stuff in their lab than I have in my lab. So I, I've got a bunch of Sony debug boards which do power control and power measurement, and it's completely different than what TimeSys has in their lab. In, the, in your case, if you've got a, a board that's between uh, 
Are you testing the gateway device or are you testing the low capability device? Okay. Okay, so testing, talking to each other. Um, I, I think the answer is yes, but I'd have to see kind of, you know, what, what the test is you're running. But I have all kinds of devices that are non-Linux and that are also acting as gateways. So like I have a Bay Libre Acme board, which is a power management device or power measurement device in my lab. And uh, that, that works fine with this. I can use it as, I can actually use it as a, a target for tests, uh, but I can also use it as, um, a, as a lab resource, which is one of my devices that I'm controlling to, to capture data from other, other machines. So, so I think the answer is yes, but I'd have to see more details to be sure. Yeah, that's that's the part where you you would have to integrate. So whichever you're using as your oh we we're, we're out of time, uh, but uh, I'll I'll answer your question offline. <laughs> so uh, thank you everyone uh, for for coming.